Dear me, Father, thank you, Lord, for this day you've given. Thank you for the wonderful weather. Thank you for summertime and the blessings of summer. The birds singing, the animals frolicking around, um, even the um, even the birds and the and insects. Everything is alive and moving mm -hmm. about, and, and these are just your creations and we are blessed to be in your creation. We're also blessed to be your creation. Please be with us and guide us and keep us and help us, Lord, as we um, go through this lesson and think about heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So, as good as it gets, by faith we are homeward bound. Today we're going to talk about heaven. And... <clears throat> You know, as you go through, as we go through some of these lessons and we ask some of these questions, for those who have been in the church for a while, these might seem as easy questions with easy answers. Uh, but there's a blessing in going over these things over and over again. The repetition deepens the impression. And there's always something deep that we can gain from studying God's word. So we look forward to the study and ask the Lord to bless it. So let's start with the first question. Is there a place called heaven? Can someone read for us John chapter six, verse 51? I can. Thank you. John six fifty-one. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I give for all the life of the world. Okay, so this is on the words of Christ. And it's clear that he believes in a place called heaven when he said he comes down from heaven. And but some people might say, well, he's saying he's a, he's a living bread. But that's spiritual because obviously people weren't eating him personally. Mm -hmm. So how do we know that heaven isn't just a spiritual place? Well, let's dive into a little bit more. May I, may I make a comment? Yes, you can. In spite of all the information we have in scripture on heaven and other writers for that matter, there's a lot that we really don't know about heaven. That's true, that's true. And, um, if God wanted us to know more, he would have revealed more. Um, but what he has revealed to us is wonderful. And okay. we're I'm looking sorry. forward to um, what he has for us. So yeah, I, I agree with your point that- um, To me, that's especially true with the, in the fact that the Trinity are omnipresent. They can be everywhere at the same time. Yes. And that's yeah. beyond comprehension. That's right, that's right. Excellent. So let's let's divide this out. So next question is, what is the what is the Bible actually referring to when it mentions heaven? So you can tell there's three different verses. So there are three different heavens, and um, or three different areas we can we can say that's referred to as heaven. So we want to make sure that we are all on board on which heaven we're talking about as far as being our eternal home. So can someone read Genesis 7, verse 23, another person read Genesis 22, verse 17, and another person read Matthew 5, verse 16. I'll take Genesis 7, 23. Okay, thank you. And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things in the fall of the heaven. Excellent. So the fall of the, of the heaven, we know that the birds fly through the air. So that's mm -hmm. one area that's also referred to as either air or heaven. So how about Genesis 22, verse 17? Who could read that for us, please? I, I can read it. Okay, that, thank you. In blessing, I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven. Thank you. So the second heaven, if you will, is 
where the stars dwell. So that's outer space. Um, back in Bible times, they didn't refer to that as outer space. It is called in heaven. But um, that's another level. And then Matthew 5, verse 16. I can do that one. All right, thank you. Let your light so shine before men that you may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Excellent. Thank you. And so there's a different heaven, or someone could say, well, how do we know that the verse in Matthew 5, verse 16 is referring to the air? Well, people have been in the air all over the world and they haven't come across, you know, God in, in the air and that, in that, and I'm not saying that he can't be, but, you know, he's just not in the air. And then someone could say, well, what about space? Um, well, yes, technically, yes, but there's a spe specific part of space that's also referred to as heaven, which we're reading about in, in uh, Matthew 5, 16. And as we read the lesson more and more, that'll become abundantly clear. Brother Roy, it seems as if you're trying to speak. Can you hear us? Okay, but we can't hear you. So you might want to log in and log back out because that might help you to maybe something. Technology sometimes helps us, but sometimes technology has flaws. So you might want to try again. One comment. Uh, sure. The first heaven there talks about the uh, fowls of the air. That would refer to the atmosphere that surrounds the earth. Yes. When we're talking about the stars of heaven, that would include the other planets throughout the universe. And they also must have some type of an atmosphere as well. That's true. That's true. Which we haven't seen, but one day by God's grace, we will. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the next slide, which is, is heaven a physical place? to which God's people can go. Um, can someone read these two verses for us, please? How about you, dear? Could you do that for us? Okay. Is heaven a physical place to which God's people can go to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Thank you. So this, this answers the question about a physical space because um, mansions are physical. A house is physical. And um, is there a comment um, from Elder Skortz? Yes. Uh, with reference to heaven, I like to think of heaven as God's center of operation. But then when you think of the millions and millions of angels, uh, that must make heaven pretty large. Yeah, there's no, there's no, um, there's no indication that heaven is a small place. <laughs> um, and even, even in the Bible, when it refers to the city, the New Jerusalem, as it's called, which we'll get to later on, that's not, that doesn't imply that that's all that heaven is, just one city. It could be much more space around it, who knows? I mean, these are things that we'll find out then when, by God's grace, we go. We don't know these details now. But heaven is a, uh, is a glorious place. Any other comments before we go to the next slide? Yes, I have a comment about John 14, um, 2 through 4. It just kind of brings me back to thinking about how we need to have faith in God. So we have to have faith. We believe we have faith in knowing um, you know, God is who he is without actually seeing him. And so I think because we have faith in, you know, like, how do we question if there's a heaven? 
you know, when he's clearly told us he went back to prepare to actually, well, Jesus did to actually do something for us, prepared his place for us in that he was coming back to get us. And so when she was, when Margaret was reading that, I was just thinking about how that, how that in itself is just so faith, faith based. Yes, you know, and um, we've heard of people, I don't know the names per se, but we've heard of people, maybe people who are um, astronauts and others who, you know, at one point in time, they, they said something like, oh, I've, I've gone to space. I've gone through the atmosphere, through the clouds. I didn't see God there. I went to, you know, orbited around the, the um, earth or the moon, whatever it is, I didn't see God there. So therefore God is not there. But as we, again, if you understand what the Bible says, the Bible never said that if you go to the moon, you'd find God. Or if you go to a cloud right above, you know, the equator, you'll find God there. No one ever, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible, like we said, there's three different space areas that are referred to as heaven. And where God is, is different than what's around this earth. How will we get to heaven? Can someone read that for us, please? Yes, I can read it. <clears throat> First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself shall depend, de descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Excellent. So, um, again, Christ himself said with regard to um, heaven, I mean, what it says here by the Apostle Paul is that there's, there's going to be two different types of people that go to heaven, either those who are resurrected, as described here, saying the dead in Christ, or those who are, what we like to use the word translated, which is, and it's described in um, first um, Corinthians chapter 15, towards the end of the chapter, that those who, when Christ comes, they're alive, and they're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And those two groups of people, those who are dead and then are resurrected, and those who are changed, they're going to meet in the air, meet Christ in the air, and then everyone is going to go to heaven. So what is heaven going to be like? Christian, can you read this for us, please? For as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love them. This text here, if we don't understand and take the Bible as a whole. This text here can on one hand be very exciting, but can also be confusing. So it can be exciting because it says, look, you know, we, eye hasn't seen it, ear hasn't heard. We can't even imagine, it's basically saying we can't even imagine what God has prepared for those who love him. All right. But then we have, examples which we'll cover later on in, in the presentation of people who have said they've seen heaven. So I ask, well, if these people have seen heaven, then how can, the, how can it be written that eyes have not seen? Or if people have envisioned, seen heaven and heard what people are saying in heaven, then how can it be, they say that ear hasn't heard? So it seems as if this, uh, some people might think this text is contradicting other texts in the Bible, but is that what it's really is that what it's really saying? Let's talk about that for a second. Is it saying that when someone else says in the Bible, "I've seen this in heaven," or um, "I've been I've done this in heaven," is is this text basically saying that they don't know what they're talking about? What is this text really saying? Hearing crickets, I wonder why. <laughs> um, 
it's just saying that we I don't want to be super simplistic but I think is it saying that that we eyes haven't seen nor ears have even heard that we can't even imagine what heaven is like neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him so can we is it saying that we just don't even have an idea of how amazing heaven is yeah pretty much so, um yeah so i'll i think where i think your thing is working now okay, okay. Uh, i was gonna say it's saying that because as human beings we don't have a clue mm -hmm. except for what's mm -hmm. written in the bible about uh, what heaven's going to look like so there's no sense of us even projecting but it's beyond our imagination. So if we can't even imagine it, I, we try to describe something we haven't seen, it makes no sense. Amen. Um, yeah, so the, the answer to this question, we're all on the right path. The answer to this question, there's a couple different ways to answer it. Again, we're, we're taught as we read, we don't take, we don't build our theology on one verse. Right. You look at everything in there. And there's too many passages in the Bible that describes different things in heaven to say that no one has seen any of these things because otherwise, how would you be able to describe it? So, right. and you know that the Bible is not one passage isn't at war with another passage. So it's really more of we just may not understand how to understand the verse. So you can be understood in a couple different ways. Number one, it can be looked at from the context of, yes, outside of revelation from God, because no human being has actually been in heaven to see anything, or mm -hmm. no human being, I'm talking about outside those who God, besides God, sorry, besides those people that God has brought there. So obviously Enoch and Moses, Elijah, they're in heaven. I'm just talking about the average run in the mill person here. Like everyone on this, everyone on this um, Zoom call, <clears throat> none of us have been to heaven. Hmm. Um, so we can never say that I, I was in heaven and I saw what was there because I've never been and you've never been to heaven. Okay. And none, since we've never been there, we've never also heard what's going on in heaven. And heaven is so wonderful that our imagination is so limited that we can't even imagine how wonderful heaven is. So mm. it looked at from a outside of <clears> those, <throat> those few who God has given special revelation and those who he's actually taken to heaven for everyone else, we, we've never seen it, never heard it, and it, we can't even imagine it. Another way to look at this is that, and we're gonna look at it later on, that the Bible talks about how wonderful heaven is, but it also talks about the fact there's going to be a new heaven. Mm. And so God is even going to make what's already wonderful, even more wonderful. Mm. And so, and God can continue to make heaven even more wonderful. So as we live throughout the eternal ages, there's nothing, there's nothing stopping God from continually improving and making it better and better and better and better as time goes on. And so we know, again, the Bible's not warring against itself. Um, there are people who have been able to see heaven by vision. There's some people who are actually there. Um, but for most of us, we're not there and we can't even imagine how wonderful it is. Hmm. Okay, let's go to the next one, which goes into what we just talked about. Has anyone ever seen heaven and written about it? So, Brother Roy, would you please read um, Revelation 4, verse 1 through 3? And Elder Scorch, yeah. would you read Revelation 21, verse 18 through 19? Okay. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne and he that sat was to look upon like jasper and the sardis stone 
and there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight unto an emerald. And Revelation 21, 18, to 19, 18 and 19, and the building of the wall of it was of the jasper, and the city was pure gold, like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Thank you very much. And then the text goes on to mention some of those precious stones. Um, and so, yes, there mm -hmm. have been people that have seen heaven mm -hmm. and they describe it as a wonderful place, a place uh, of beauty and of richness that we can't even imagine um, from our, our own vantage point. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, to have a city made of pure gold, Mm -hmm. um, and that gold be clear as glass. So that's not even just run the mill gold you see at the jeweler store around here. We're talking right. about extremely pure gold. And then to have foundations of different precious stones and gates of pearl and everything thrown. There's a throne in heaven for the Lord, and it's a uh, Beautiful throne. It's so. It's a lot of. It's a lot of detail that the Bible does give about heaven, um, but yet there's still so much more that we're going to be able to enjoy. But don't you feel that John, the Revelator, is using these adjectives to describe heaven because to humanity, uh, these uh, these. Uh, 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 stones are most precious, most valuable, most important. So, okay, so, um, so, yes, but when you say that, are you saying that he's just mentioning them because he knows that that would get our attention, or is he mentioning it because they look like these things, but they're not? I'm not sure which one you're trying to say. Could be both. <laughs> well, I, 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 would, I, would, I, would say, I would say that he's revealing it because it was revealed to him. And um, the same God that had the, um, the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with pure gold and had the different materials in the sanctuary, a golden, golden candlestick and um, golden altar and um, the show table show bread covered with gold and you know, all this embroidery. There's a reason why the Bible tells us that what we see in the earthly sanctuary is a model of those in heaven. So God using precious metals is, is uh, and mentioning them is not a, um, a, an advertisement just to get our attention. Um, these are actual facts. And um, a God who cre can create a universe by just speaking, there's no, there's, he wouldn't have any problem making a city made of gold. Amen. I agree. I also would say that as we see these stones here on earth, uh, stones that are in heaven are pure and undefiled by what's here on earth as the gold there is transparent. So I can't even imagine what the jaspers and the emeralds look like there because they're pure and unsullied by sin. Uh, but the closest thing we have is what we see here. Uh, so I can imagine it's even better than what we think or what we read about. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was I was talking to a co-worker this week that had just gone to Hawaii. And so he had did some videos of um, zip lining over some um, waterfalls. It was many waterfalls and different stuff. And I was like commenting on how beautiful it was. And he said, 
he said, oh, he said, just um, the video just does not do it justice. Mm -hmm. And so I just was thinking about that. Like, you know, we can sit here. Our little feeble minds can't really mm -hmm. imagine certain things. We can't even imagine because, you know, we see these large stones and they're so beautiful and everything. So just imagine if our feeble mind just think this stuff here on earth is beautiful, you know, eyes cannot even probably imagine how beautiful it is when we're in heaven. Like there's nothing that'll do, do it justice until we see it in person. So, and the good news is that we are invited to go and by God's grace, when he comes again, he'll take us. Amen. What other significant aspect of heaven is revealed in the book of Revelation? And then also, where is Jesus now and what is he doing? Dear, could you read for us um, Hebrews 8, 1 through 2? But before then, um, Sister Carolyn, could you please read Revelation 11, verse 19, please? Sure. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. Okay. Okay. Now of the things which we have spoken this, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who was set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Amen. <clears throat> So I liked how the lesson included this because not only is heaven, you know, you know, there's a big city there, there's walls and city made of gold and pearly gates and everything, but also the Bible talks about there being a temple of God in heaven. And so as a church, when we tell people that there is a heavenly sanctuary, it's not something we've made up. The Bible oh. says that there's a temple in heaven. And the Bible also says that the ark of his testimony is in heaven. The Bible says that Christ is there as our high priest, ministering, ministering in the sanctuary that's in heaven. Um, and so that is that's a wonderful truth that we don't go into much detail now, but we go into further um, studies, we'll go into it much more detail, but heaven and what Jesus is doing in heaven are inextricably linked. And I'm glad that they mentioned it here because it's important for us to recognize that Jesus is in heaven right now. And um, he is um, doing a wonderful work for us. The scribes is intercessory work. Absolutely. Will God's people be in heaven for all eternity? What will the new earth be like? Nathaniel, could you please read the first two verses, which is um, 2 Peter 3, verse 13, and Revelation 21, verse 2? Then, Brother Roy, could you please read Revelation 22, verses 1 through 2? Okay. Okay. So I do the top two. Wait, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nevertheless, we according to his we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And I I'm I'm bringing the next one by the way. And I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, sorry, heaven, prepare, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. And Revelation 22, 1 and 2. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, the, was there the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits, 
yielding her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. In the book of Job, it says in um, chapter one that the sons of God came together and Satan came there and then God asked him what he was doing there. And you recall his answer. His mm -hmm. answer was, I'm walk, I walk to and fro the earth. And anyone that studies the Bible and, and looks at that language and looks at similar language that God uses for um, Abraham saying everywhere you say you set your foot will be yours or the children of Israel when they go into the new um, the promised land saying everywhere your foot goes is going to be yours. What Satan was basically saying is I, I own the whole earth. That's why I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then like you said, in, 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 when everything is all wrapped up, Christ is not only going to redeem this earth, gonna, but he's going to make it his headquarters. So the place where Satan said he owns the place is where mm -hmm. God is going to bring the new Jerusalem to be, to clearly yeah. show that Satan doesn't own anything. Yeah. And then um, in the same book of Job, when Job is, you know, you can say he's complaining about what's, what's happened to him. And God asked him questions like, where were you when I created this and I created that? Like you said, for those who are going to be saved and we, and we believe from what we can see in the Bible that Job will be among them, mm -hmm. Job is gonna see God recreate these things. So oh. where it was true that Job wasn't there in the very beginning of earth to see those things, He's going to be able to see those things with earth made new. Yeah. And so God is very wonderful in how he handles his people. Yes, Elder Scores. Um, may I add another unknown? Billions of people that have been born and live on this earth. When you consider how many people have lived on this earth and living on this earth, there must be millions who will be saved. So can you imagine how huge heaven must be? Yeah, and God says he's yeah. made a, a place for us, so he uh, is well able to make sure there's enough room for everybody. Amen. <clears throat> what does God intend to do with us throughout eternity? What else do we know about heaven? Christian, could you read um, the first verse for us, please? And then, dear, could you read the second one? I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. Thank you. And, yeah. and, there, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Amen. Any thoughts as we read these two verses? It makes me wonder what, if anything, we'll remember of the trials and tribulations, because he says he's wiping away all tears. That's right. And oh. there'll be no, be no remembrance. Uh, that's something to thank God for, because you think of all the disappointments, the hurts, the flights, I mean, <clears throat> that we go through on a daily basis. And, and for years, if we're on this earth from 70 to 100 years, that's a lot to have all that hurt and everything wiped away, oh. that, there, that there'll be no more tears that we won't think about these things. So I, I look forward to that. I do. Amen. Amen. Actually reset. Um, the thing that I thought about with uh, No More Sun, um, you know how many people worship the sun and it's uh, hard to imagine life without the sun, but God said there'll be no need of that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously those who are worshiping the side wouldn't be heaven anyways. But to your point that there's things that people, there's things, there's things that people highly esteem that God has created and they put the gift over the giver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God is um, obviously great, big greater than any gift he gives. Mm -hmm. What does the Bible say about God's people, what God's people will do in the new earth? How else does God describe the blessedness of our forever home? All right, Sister Stacy, would you read this? Sure. Isaiah 65, 17, 19, 21 through 25. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree... For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands, they shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble. For they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offering, and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together, and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountains, mountains, saith the Lord. Amen. Mm. Any thoughts? Um, it's nice that the Lord is going to reward those because in, in this world, there are many people who work and labor and um, work in vain for, for things. Yeah, for others. And they never get to experience the, you know, the reward of their work. And yeah. it's just like endless, useless, senseless toil. Yes. Hello? And you see hope in there, too, when you mm -hmm. read... Um, um, they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. Mm -hmm. That just seem like, you know, just some, just power and just knowing that it won't only be you, but, you know, it definitely could be your offspring as well. That's right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How can a person have the assurance that he or she can look forward to eternity with God? Brother Roy, could you read this for us, please? These two verses. Sure. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is of God, and blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Amen. That's so we, um, these two verses are very nice to be put together because on one hand, it makes it clear that um, we're saved through faith. It's not through our works. That's the next verse. That's um, Ephesians 2 verse 9. That's not through our works, lest any man should boast. So we know that we're not saved by our works. Yet, God still <laughs> says that we're blessed when we keep his commandments. So as we keep his commandments by faith, as we're saved by faith and by grace, we will have a right to the tree of life. And, and, those, who have, and those who have right to the tree of life, and, can, and, and the tree of life is in the city, those people will be able to spend eternity with God. Yes, Elder Scorch. Yeah. Uh, 
we keep the commandments of God not to be saved, but because we are saved, because of what Christ has done for us. So yes. that's the relationship that we have. Yes, absolutely. Very good. So the closing question for us today is, would you be willing to surrender your life to Jesus now and ask him to live his life in you? Because yes. if you are, if the answer is yes, then you can have the assurance by faith, by the grace of God, that you will be able to spend eternity with him and you will see heaven. 